Okay, well, um, Brian, um, uh, firstly, uh, welcome back to Manchester. Um, Thank you. I know you've, you're very familiar with it in all sorts of ways, but uh, I think this is probably the uh, first time you've been in this department for a, for a yes. while. Yes, and the, the Arthur Lewis building didn't exist no, no, when, it didn't. No. when I left. Yes. Yes. Okay, so, I mean, what, I, what I'd like to do is, is just to um, um, you know, talk chiefly about your time in Manchester, mm -hmm. um, but also um, perhaps we might start with a little um, about your sort of career before coming to Manchester, because I think that's extremely interesting. And, and, and the fact that you, I think, started out by um, doing a degree in history at, uh, yeah. at Balliol, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so could you say a little about the transition from history to sociology? Well, I loved history in high school <coughs> and uh, went to Balliol, read history. Then uh, decided to specialise in medieval history. Mm. But the only problem was, towards the end of this course, I was feeling, I don't know, this is terribly relevant. And this was the period in Britain mm. when everything was going to be renewed, reform was in the air, mm. etc. Okay. You know, Harold Macmillan was gone, and mm. new possibilities were emerging, mm. etc., or was going. And so, um, so and it's at the same time that the country in a strange mood, the Sunday newspapers started to talk about this new subject sociology mm, that mm. could really make a modern Britain fit for the modern Europe and the modern mm, world, etc. Mm. So, and there was a group of us in, in, in Oxford that were interested mm. in sociology and uh, started a coal society there. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen Lukes is oh, one yes, of the yes, you yeah, know, better known people yeah, of, of yeah. that. And, um, and so we did that and then we had this uh, lovely kind of American sociologist, Norman Birnbaum, oh, yes, yes. who had decided to come to Oxford mm. to uh, study with Christopher Hill, mm. who was one of my tutors in, in, mm. in Baylor. And um, he did that because he was interested in the Civil War in England mm. from a sociological perspective. Yeah. And of course, Christopher Hill was ideal mm. because his approach was Marxist mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and so social structure and, and, mm. and the relationship between that and social movements mm. was central to it. But anyway, Norman Birnbaum was this classic New York person mm. into, into conspiracy. So he, yes. he summoned this small group of students to cafes at Oxford and talk about the way you could really undermine the traditional mm. disciplines and so on and so forth. Mm. But more practically, he also helped us to apply to American universities, oh, okay. and um, and he helped me to go mm. to apply to Chicago University mm. of Chicago, and they they offered me, you know, a scholarship, and so off I went. Um, mm. The the only problem was, on arrival, um, it was discovered that the Chicago, the new Chicago, which I got to in 1964. Mm. Um, was at the period where it was transitioning away from its more qualitative approaches mm -hmm. to sociology, mm -hmm. David Reisman, Anselm yeah, Strauss, sure, these yeah. kind of people, to much more quantitative mm -hmm. approaches. In fact, mm -hmm. my first mm -hmm. interview there, and I'd come to study sociology, and mm -hmm. this guy looked at me, um, actually Donald Bogue, a well-known demographer, oh, yes, yeah. and he said, um, well, look, he said, the new word is sociometrics. So I want you this, in your first semester, to learn sociology, to take these three courses. It was uh, advanced statistics, um, advanced social psychology, which was also which was also highly statistical, mm -hmm. and I think the third was also incredibly quantitative. Mm -hmm. None of which seemed to have any sociological, mm -hmm. as far as I understood mm -hmm. it at that point, content. But mm -hmm. anyway, that was the beginning. Um, okay. It, Chicago was fine, mm -hmm. but um, and yes, there were some good people there. Peter Blau was mm -hmm. there, and, and I had a wonderful uh, supervisor, mm -hmm. David Street, who mm -hmm. unfortunately died. He had um, mm -hmm. really leukemia, and so it, mm -hmm. um, he died not too long after I graduated. But he was a wonderful person, really mm -hmm. supportive, and um, he paid for me to um, do research on a project he and Morris Janowitz were doing on on schools, education oh, right. okay. in Chicago. Yes, right. So s strictly I became an educational sociologist. Oh yes, yes, yes I remember that was your interest. It's so like that. Yeah. So, yeah. But that was three years. Yeah, right. I only stayed three years yeah. to do the MA and the mm -hmm. PhD, which was somewhat of a record. Mm. In, in, in Austin, our average length yeah. of uh, PhDs is now about eight or nine years. Mm. No, I, I noticed the three years. I thought that was uh, very so interesting. So there was like that. But part of it was, mm. you know, <coughs> 
I didn't mm. get that much out of it. Right, I felt right. a little bit, because mm. uh, transitioning from the humanistic mm. approaches mm. of history, of course, mm. to that kind of much more mm. quantitative hard sociology, mm. I found it a little difficult mm. and uh, didn't properly adjust mm. to it. Mm. In fact, the irony was, it was when I came to, to here, Manchester, in, in, when the Department of Sociology was founded in '64, mm -hmm. and, um, and and the sub department of sociology was going mm -hmm. to have to teach its own courses, mm -hmm. and the person who taught urban sociology was Valdo Pons, mm -hmm. who you remember, of course. Yes, of course. And unfortunately, when I arrived, he he uh, fell ill, and mm -hmm. so. Um, must have been Max Gluckman and, and Peter Worsley, probably. Mm. And they said, Brian, will you, will you teach the urban sociology course? You've just oh. graduated from Chicago. And I said, well, I can do urban sociology <laughs> in Chicago. But it didn't matter because, didn't matter city, because sure. what, what, I went to the library, got yeah. out all the books. But yes. that was the irony. Yeah. I learned about mm. the Chicago mm. School of Urban Sociology in Manchester, in Manchester <laughs> rather than, yeah. than on in Chicago itself. But, yeah. that was, uh, but that was the way mm. into it. But... Was it made yeah. also a sense because I was easy prey, I don't think that's a good word for mm. it, then to the more anthropological, mm. ethnographic approaches yeah. that, of course, mm. the Manchester School was famous mm. for. And, um, and you, know, you remember these, mm. the kind of seminars we used to have weekly, yeah. you know, in which everybody would discuss the latest findings mm. from field work, normally done mm. in exotic places right. like yeah. you know yeah. Africa or the Middle mm. East, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. Mm. Intense discussions, analysis mm. of the data. Mm. And it was very exciting mm. intellectually. Oh, yes. yeah. And um, and since when I was in Chicago, um, I met, met mm. my mm. still wife, mm -hmm. Susan, who mm. you know, of yes, course, I know my still wife. Um, her sister was studying in the National University of, of yeah. Mexico. Right. So we went down one terribly cold mm. Christmas time to Mexico mm. City and were bowled over. Mexico mm. in 1962 when we mm. went down there was so beautiful, mm. so warm and you know and it was unpolluted then mm. because the traffic hadn't built up etc. Mm -hmm. so you saw the snow cap not cables mm. etc. In addition to this they were ruled by a party called the Revolutionary Institutional Party right. which <laughs> subsequently I found out was quite what it seemed and but anyway it's, uh, it's, it all seemed wonderful. Jill's friends were all these mm. left-wing academics and mm -hmm. you know and and artists etc. Mm. So it's a wonderful intellectual environment so mm. Sue and I said it's almost joking, it would be great to get back to Mexico if mm. we could. And the chance came up mm. in yes, Manchester, indeed, yeah. here in Manchester, yeah. you know, when an American anthropologist, uh, actually from Texas, mm. who was then head of the anthropology department mm -hmm. in Texas, but also head of the Institute of yeah. American Studies, he was looking for European mm. social anthropologists mm. to join his yes, project. Yeah. And he approached Max, mm. who is a great empire builder. Mm. Like over that. So, that, yeah. so he said, yes, yes I'll find mm. you somebody. Of course, none of my real anthropological colleagues were interested. No, because, you know, that's right. It's not Africa, it's not the mm, Middle East, mm. and it's a total new territory for British mm, anthropologists. Mm. So, um, but I heard about this and mm. volunteered, and um, Max was quite happy, provided mm. I read a whole list of anthropology <laughs> books yeah. and took tutorials from Paul Baxter. Ah, yes. I can remember that at the time, who was... Yeah, he retired. He retired. Yeah, yeah of course, everybody's yeah. retired now. Yeah. It's only American academics don't retire. <laughs> you don't have to. Okay, I mean, several sort of themes have emerged from what you've just said. Can I just, um, before we leave it, because um, although you made this transition from history to sociology, you, did, you didn't really leave history behind, did no. you? I, mean, I think you were involved in the journal Past and Present, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. And. Um, um, I, I don't know if you remember that um, extraordinary time when Peter Worsley brought John Savile, Edward Thompson and Raphael Samuel all over in the same week to yeah. uh, give a whole series of uh, mm -hmm. very exciting seminars mm -hmm. and, and so on. Um, so I, don't, uh, and, uh, I think that you know, we had, a, I think, a reasonably successful joint history sociology degree running for quite a while. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, do you have any sort of reflections about the... Um, links between history and sociology? And no, well, for me nowadays, it's, it, it's fairly fundamental. Yeah. Obviously, it's sociologists mm. have a different approach than hist historians do in terms of mm. documentary evidence yeah, sure. and how you accumulate mm. it. But, but for me, you cannot understand 
certain phenomena, contemporary phenomena, without placing them in the historical context. Mm. My own work in Latin mm. America, for example, what I'm doing nowadays is consistently trying to remind people mm. that the period of urbanization, which I mm. studied more intensely, which is in the 60s and 70s mm. in Latin America, was a very peculiar historical mm. moment. Peculiar mm. because mm. it was the period known as import substituting industrialization, right. in which okay. tariff protection, etc., and which led also to nationalist economics, mm. nationalist mm. politics in Latin America. And of course, that was to be destroyed in the, in the years of the 80s mm. Mm. with the debt crises and things yeah. like that. Yeah, sure. And when the Latin American economies really mm. were forced to mm. uh, make very stringent um, changes in their, in their budgeting um, under the IMF and the, the Americans, mm -hmm. etc., all pushing. They didn't do it in the 30s. Mm. No, they, they, let, right. they let their own banks take the mm. knock in the 30s mm. for the crises. Mm. Oh, but in the 80s, right. they yeah. didn't. Mm. They insisted mm. that the American governments pay back their debt. Mm. But the only way they could do it and mm. get the loans was through, through this, mm. these kind of austerity measures, yeah. fis mm. fiscal sure. discipline, and the beginnings mm. of what's typically in the Latin American literature known as neoliberalism. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. free markets, mm. privatization, mm. etc., mm. deregulation mm -hmm. of labor and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, so to me you have mm -hmm. to have that historical exactly. context yes. because yes, exactly. what was happening, yeah. the things I studied, mm -hmm. how people mm -hmm. coped in coming mm -hmm. to the city, etc., mm -hmm. the nature of poverty, actually is different, mm. not simply because you know, somehow people have evolved, they mm. tend to be the same in their strategy yeah, of survival, sure. yeah. but they're doing it in a very different mm. historical context. Mm. And to have an awareness of that mm. helps you to look at what's happening now and say, mm. look, that mm. isn't some mm. eternal sociological truth. Mm. It's reflecting how people you know, mm. make the most of what they can. Mm in, in, in mm. a particular yeah. changing yeah, environment. Sure. Yeah. And so, so that, that aspect of it. Mm. And just generally, you mm. know, getting a sense mm. of, of history and mm. therefore change mm. and the importance of, of culture in mm. behavior mm. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, history very, very important. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other thing that went along with that then was that, that what I did get from here in those early years, and of course mm. you, you know that well, was the much more the value of ethnography. Yes, very much so. Yes. That, you know, that so you, <coughs> so mm. sociology, some form of sociology, even quantitative sociology mm. could be useful. And I mm. do use yeah. censuses and surveys, but yeah. at the same time, the meaning of things mm. is best brought out by case studies, mm. ethnographic case yeah. studies, to my mind. Yes, well, I, I, I'm, obviously I would agree with that, yeah. and that was very much the, the tone of uh, um, the department at that time. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it was also the time when there had been this kind of formal split between yeah. anthropology and sociology, a, a divorce with all the um, yeah. <laughs> associated tensions and dramas that uh, go along with divorces. Um, well, did you get any sort of sense of um, what was going on at the time? Did, you, did it strike you as a, a dramatic split or something which was... Um... Well, it, I wouldn't say a dramatic split, yeah. it yeah. became... It became, it became, you know, I think there was a, the beginnings of mm. polarization. Uh, mm. My fellow Welshman, Emrys Peters, oh, yes, you know, is well known for his, you know, mm. desire to keep things mm. you know, nicely under his control, mm. etc., etc., and um, and suspicious of sociology mm. and what sociology yeah. may be. Mm. And Peter, Peter Worsley, of course, mm. was very, very interested in, mm. you know, developing the more mm. sociological perspective, Clyde, Clyde mm. Mitchell comes in, yeah. and of course then Theodore, Theodore comes in, mm. and you know, so Theodore Shanin. And so all of that, so the departments then begin to differentiate mm. on kind of, you know, what they're doing lines, and to a certain extent on career lines. Mm. That's right. Yeah. And of course yeah. some of the old yeah. people that we knew leave anthropology. Mm. Yeah. Norman goes, yes, that's right. and, um, and also Bruce, mm. Bruce goes mm. very quickly, yeah, yes. etc. Mm. Other compatible people, mm. Keith Hart, mm. yeah. are to go. Thanks. So, the, went, yeah. so yeah. increasingly, the, the anthropology mm. department looks a little different mm. okay, from the sure. department mm. I knew, mm. and so that's the thing. But mm. the, I think one of the major kind of mm. issues that I had with them came over the uh, single degree. Mm. Yes, that's right. Now you remember that history, mm. indeed, you know, the, yes, indeed. and people should remember it, you know, the original degree of economic and social studies was actually uh, um, 
an, uh, an economic and social studies mm. degree. Everybody coming in had to do basic courses in sociology, anthropology, mm. yeah. economics, and government, right. and polystatistics. So yes, yeah. and so like that. And that that would be the first year. Second year, you could specialize a little more mm. by taking probably I think two mm. courses mm. in in anthropology, yes, sociology, right, yeah. and mm. so on. And you, so you had more of a choice. Uh, third year, you could specialize. Mm. But it was, you know, it was a d degree like that. This delighted, um, this kind of arrangement, mm. by the way, delighted. I remember having this big thing with Max. It was me and Peter, 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 uh, not Peter, uh, me and uh, Colin, Colin Lacey. Now, we wanted to introduce a sociology of education mm. course into the department. And, um, and Max somehow got to hear of it. Mm. And, um, and he called me aside after a seminar and he told me this story about Zulus, which I didn't understand. He said, he said, you know, so I can tell you a story about the Zulus. The Zulu chief, he sits there and he listens mm. and he gets information, he listens. And the young Zulus, they're maybe discontented and they're plotting, mm. but he does nothing. He just mm. listens and waits. But there'll come the day when he'll get up and kill them all. He said, I want you to remember that. And he said, That's this, <laughs> this idea of sociology of education is a non-starter. And his argument, and it's an interesting one, was, you see, mm. that if we kept on as a joint department or a single department adding courses, that means you couldn't give leave of absence mm. to your staff. Mm. The department, one of the qualities of the of of the joint department and even of the single mm. departments was they were relatively generous with leave. And if you've only got to run, say, mm. six or seven courses, then, you, then you've then you got, um, then you only need mm. six or seven you know, people to do it. Mm. And if you've got a department of 17 or 18, you've got leeway there. Mm. And so that so this is the idea, don't cram courses, mm. which, we'll, um, which then will cramp our own ability to mm. allow people to go away on field work, have leaves of absence, etc. But there came that point of time, remember when, mm. as I think it's Martin Southwold once described it, he said, there were these people in dingy suits and ties in a tiny little office in the basement of Dover Street, and they were supposed to be doing accountancy, but nobody, Everybody ignored them and nothing. But all of a sudden, the university decided to develop a department of accountancy within the faculty. Yeah. And that became an enormous success, because mm. now we are, we're leaving the 60s, going into the later 70s, mm. where materialism was really yeah. becoming yeah, sure. very That's strong. Right. Yeah. And students wanted to do a degree that would get them a job with money. Yeah, and so right. our applicants for the joint degree were <laughs> swamped mm. by people who were going to mm. want to do accountancy. Mm. And since this was, um, yeah, you know, a, going to be a first-rate department mm. of accountancy uh, without much rival mm. anywhere else, you know, most of the applicants mm. who came for accountancy had very high A-levels, mm. etc. Mm. So they were the ones that were admitted. Yeah. So we soon found ourselves, you know, simply serving other departments. Mm. And mm. We weren't the only ones that had mm. this problem, but at least... You know, I think mm. sociology and anthropology mm. both were hit by that. Mm. Mm. And so there seemed this future in which mm. increasingly all we do is teach these students, mm. yeah. you know, a service kind of That's thing and nothing yeah. else. Yeah. So then arose the idea, why don't we start um, a single, you know, yes, a, our own honours degree yeah. in sociology or in yeah. anthropology, etc. Yeah. And of course we began the, the uh, which you mentioned earlier, the joint the joint honours degrees. Yeah. Remember, we did it with history, history religious studies, religious studies, religious studies was the first. Yeah, that's what it was. Because it was the then professor. He was yeah. um, oh, he was a really great scholar. Yes, of, so, of, um, yeah, of obviously, but, we but, both but a very open man. That's right, he, yeah. So he was the first one who opened up his arms mm, to us. So we had right. religious studies. We had. Uh, did we have a geography? I don't think we did. Um, no, because Brian, Town planning, I think, there was some involved. Yeah, we had probably had something like that. Yeah. Joint degrees, but also the single yeah, honours right. degree. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But this course is sectioned because, um, because the anthropologists, i.e. Mm. mainly uh, Emrys, Emrys Peters mm. and Paul Baxter, uh, felt this was betraying the whole principle mm. of the other degree. You know, it, 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 I don't know, I'm not imputing anything, it was, you know, but, but anyway, they was beginning to try to stir yeah. things up about yeah. this, and yeah. the, faculty was, the faculty itself mm. was beginning to be mm. divided about this. There was mm. a certain ill feeling going on. I think there was, yeah. And, uh, but in the end, of course, the, the, um, the, joint, the single degree came through mm. with the other things, and, um, and 
Mm. Certainly the anthropologists subsequently mm. were to say, well, you know, it was a great thing. Yeah. Because it certainly yeah. helped them. Oh, uh, absolutely, yes. As, no, I think it as I think it did. Yeah. The yes. department no, I think too. We, I think we all benefited from yeah. that. Um, the uh, religious that was um, Trevor Ling, by the way. Mm. Who, um, Trevor Ling, yes. His uh, book with the wonderful title Buddha, Marx, and God. Which I, <laughs> was, I think like was that, yeah. one of the best titles yeah. I could think of. Um, I mean, I, I think there's, the other thing, of course, that was happening around about that time um, was this was a time of sort of student upheaval, you know, particularly yeah. as we moved through the 60s and. Um, uh, the development of some, the campaign for academic freedom and democracy, yeah. and uh, so there's quite a lot of other things going on um, uh, within well, within the university, but of course actually reflected um, sort of wider upheavals throughout throughout the world, I suppose, in some mm -hmm. senses. Um, do you have any particular sort of memories of of uh, that kind of? confrontations. And well, I remember, you know, Max Gluckman, who, mm. of course, himself had once been a communist and, you know, mm. and, and quite radical in his view, mm. being appalled by mm. this, these students who yes. were uh, sort of you know, <laughs> in revoked. Mm. He just could not understand it. And he stormed in, I think, one time to the refractory to to, to cleanse the temple of, 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 right. of these students at one stage. And so, so everybody <laughs> had to try to restrain him mm. and sort of mm. he didn't get out of it. And... Um, no, and it was it was a peculiar period, I think, for um, for sociologists, especially ones who who were um, you know, hierarchically in control of the professors, etc. Because mm -hmm. um, it was also the period of the belief in in democracy, mm -hmm. um, not quite student democracy in terms of mm -hmm. you know, assessment of courses, whatever it is, but certainly faculty having mm -hmm. a voice. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. as as you remember, in those mm -hmm. days. Um, Everybody signed a contract to the professor. Mm, that's right. And yeah, yeah. The contract literally said, you will do what the professor tells you, etc. like that. So the department and members of the department really didn't have much of a voice in appointments, mm. for example. Like, you know, the big contrast when I went to America was, you know, that everybody in a department and votes on, on an appointment. Mm. And in fact, it's only the department mm. that decides on an appointment. Mm. With, with us at that stage, mm. the professor would be a member, or professors with more than one. Mm. They, would, they would select two people from the department to join mm. them on the committee, and select two people from outside the department mm. to join them on the committee. And you know, and so the, so this was going to be an, a, an area of contention. Mm -hmm. You know, what what role should the, the you know the staff meeting and staff votes mm -hmm. have in making decisions? And I think mm -hmm. that that in the in, in the late sixties, I, I remember because the you know people we had at those mm -hmm. remember temporary lecturers or oh yes. Yeah. That, that one was Atkinson, Atkinson um, Dick Atkinson. Dick, Dick Atkinson, yes. but also Isabel, Isabel Griffiths. Was Isabel was temporary for quite a long time. At a yeah. time like yeah. that. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, so they felt, yeah. you know, they, they should have a little more say. In that's things. right, yeah. and, and that was very <coughs> difficult, I mm. think, for, you know, so, you know, well, Peter found it difficult at that time. I, I think so. I mean, I remember that I, I, I was part of a small delegation with, with Isabel yeah. uh, Emmett and, um, and Rod Watson, mm -hmm. who uh, uh, when a new, a new chair was about to be filled, and yeah. we felt we were trying to argue for greater participation yeah. from the department, which was, which was then turned down. But I think we got a very sympathetic um, mm -hmm. hearing from the, the then vice chancellor, yeah. uh, Arthur Armitage. Um, yeah, but, he was a good guy. Yeah, yeah. He was, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, the other thing which sort of, uh, um, struck me about your career at that time was you also got involved in what was then the Social Science Research Council yeah. um, for, for quite a while, I think. Yes, yeah. eight years, mm. basically. Well, it was um, mm. in 78. Mm. Um, I'd just been made professor mm. at Manchester, mm. and, um, and as I say, once they decided, you know, um, and then... You know, the English system, there's this beautiful article I always tell everybody about by, by Ralph Turner called Contest and Sponsored Mobility Systems. Oh, yes, yes. And <laughs> it's a contrast <laughs> between England and America. Yeah. England is highly, uh, sorry, America is highly competitive. Mm -hmm. You always keep competing for everything, mm -hmm. which does mean a certain element of votes and democracy, etc. Mm -hmm. Britain is not. It's sponsorship. So everything comes down from above. And appointments the SSRC did. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they, they came down from above, mm-hmm. the chairman of the committee decided who should join it, etc., etc., and so on and so forth. So I was sponsored onto the SSRC at 78. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then you're only supposed to be on for four years, but there's a way out of this. And that is that if you change your position on the committee, move from being, mm-hmm. say, a member to a vice chair or whatever it is, you, you then could be reappointed for another four years. Mm-hmm. And that could go on forever, because mm-hmm. you could be reappointed to be chair and so on and so mm-hmm. forth. And so, yes, after four years, mm-hmm. I, was, I was reappointed as vice chair of mm-hmm. the committee. Mm-hmm. And, and also, one of the reasons I think um, they were interested in me in sociology mm-hmm. was I had been writing to them previous to that about mm-hmm. the idea of why not link studentships mm-hmm. to research. Yeah. So yeah. the SSRC yeah. should give linked mm-hmm. studentships. So mm-hmm. departments, for example, could then put in mm-hmm. for a linked studentship mm-hmm. or, or staff mm-hmm. members could to, um, on a thing. And the SSRC would award a linked mm-hmm. studentship and then they'd advertise mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. terms of you can come here and be mm-hmm. paid working on this project. So. They thought that was that was interesting, mm-hmm. trying to you know get more and more research done in Britain, because yeah. this was a period where I think in the SSRC, rightly or wrongly, mm. there was a feeling that not much empirical research was being done mm. in sociology. I think there was a worry about that. Yes, yeah, yeah. so and it's you know there's a lot of theoretical mm. work of very mm. high quality being done, mm. but not so much empirical mm. research. Mm. How do we get people to mm. go out there and do interviews mm. and survey, whatever? The case studies doesn't matter mm. like that. So doing, you know, so pushing it mm. through things like links to, to linked up to actual, mm. you know, research projects, etc., seemed to be one way. So I mm. got involved in that and enjoyed it. Mm. And it's the, uh, of course, it was an interesting committee. It started off as sociology and social administration, mm. but then, then became the social affairs mm. committee, which mm. then had social anthropology, mm. demography, mm. S- and still had social administration. Mm. It's about six, dis- so, mm. you know, disciplines, mm. subdisciplines mm. in it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, it was fascinating. Mm. And, um, but of course, then we, we moved into the, the Thatcher years. We did, yeah. and, and there, I remember Keith Joseph saying, sociology is socialism. Mm. And so this didn't look good for the discipline, <laughs> and especially since he was the Minister of Education at the time. And so um, and the, the good thing on the, on the SSRC, whether it had become the ESRC by that mm. time, I don't know, was... Um, was that actually there was there was there was a wet conservative economist appointed by Margaret Thatcher he, yes. who liked him he he had been a professor at the Manchester Business School mm. Mm. and uh, the name escaped me but he was a he was a very nice man actually okay. and you know and it, you mm. know of course for Thatcher he was wet but mm. she had some affection for him and so mm. she supported him mm. he was to be the mm. head of the S- mm. ESRC and he wasn't unsympathetic. The sociology, no, no, no. and so um, so we decided on mm. the committee that one of the ways we could try to counter this thing mm. was to start this thing called the Economic Life Initiative, mm. on the grounds that you know the Conservatives say no, no, they never do anything practical mm. about mm. the economy. No, no, we don't do an Economic Life mm. Initiative, yeah. and so we launched that initiative. Yeah. Which I think was you know, reasonably successful. I think it was. I mean, it produces uh, actually a book which I, I, I referred to for quite a lot of time. Um, mm. Was it New Perspectives in Economic Life? Or yeah. Well, that's that mean? was the that was the volume that came out of came the um, out of the conference, oh, the pre-conference right. yes, right. yeah. of because yeah. we had a pre-conference mm. to discuss mm. yeah. how we'd organise the whole yeah. thing. Mm. Then then we put out the bids. Mm. But the but the initiative itself produced about six volumes. Yeah. Duncan Galley was you know, yes, the, the, right. yes, you know, course, the main person right. doing yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but Manchester was one of the departments yeah. that was involved in that research. Mm. Mm. I think that was Julian, Julian Late, and right. um, yeah. Yeah. this Stanley probably had something I, I can't remember so. who yes, else. Remember. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, it was kind of quite a very fruitful uh, period, yeah. I think. That, uh, but it was exhausting. Oh, I can imagine. Yes, this yeah. is my, my thing. That was uh, well, because you know there was also um, was a time when uh, I, can, I can remember. I, I think I was in charge of uh, graduate admissions at yeah. the time, and uh, uh, having just about to sort of uh, uh, offer places to some potential postgraduates, being told I think by you to stop because uh, there were the cuts at the uh, at the higher level, and that uh, we had to uh, we have to sort of rethink the whole. The whole yeah. thing at the last minute, which yeah. was, uh, so it was quite a dramatic no, no, time. Yeah. They put me in charge of the uh, the graduate program mm. at the SSRC, mm. and when, when they put me in charge of it, it, it had two hundred and forty fellowships to avoid. Yeah. You know, SSRC or mm. ESRC studentships to 
to allocate, mm. you know, for, you know, for, you know, the British mm. sociology, whatever it was. And um, by the time I finished, it was down to 20. Mm. No, it wasn't my fault. It was <laughs> no, just, I'm sure it wasn't. No, that's right. <laughs> so it like that, but it, no, it was drastic, mm. and you know, it was it it was uh, no, it was it was sad mm. in a way too, particularly because of course American universities are different in that um, funding does not depend upon very much upon external sources, um, but much more upon. Mm endowment income universities mm. might have can be allocated to that or or, or actually of course the, the major way of doing it mm. is through teaching and research assistantships mm. because American universities use graduates mm. to teach most of their undergraduate uh, mm. teaching and so that allows us in my department for example to appoint a, oh about 40 to 50 teaching mm. assistants mm. and yeah. they that will pay for their mm. Being a teacher and sister will pay for all their fees mm. and give them enough money to mm. live off. I mean, they're extremely mm. yeah. amount <laughs> they won't be able to do it. Yeah. So, whereas in Britain, as we know, there's very little kind of mm. source of funding outside, mm. you know, government ESRC, mm. SSRC funding, mm. and the occasional fellowship mm. you can pick mm. up. Mm. No, no, that was, it was, these were tight times. They were, yes. Yeah. No, and, <laughs> uh, no, because I can remember, you, you know, you, that whole thing. Well, and of course the university too, because mm. this was the time we were involved in the whole, you know, trying to get single degree, mm. and internal politics of that, and mm. internal um, internal administration of the department was uh, getting increasingly difficult. I can mm. always remember the time when they decided that the professors now had to monitor the phone calls of their of of their staff. Yes, this wasn't, a, I should point out, not in terms of content, but in terms of the, uh, the use. Of yeah, the, the use of it and it. how much they were spending. That's right, yes. And so they had to be able to yeah. put a limit on this. Yes, yes. And if you're dealing with somebody like my good friend, Ken Brown, this, <laughs> this is almost impossible. <laughs> it's always folding the Middle East, the United yes. States, etc., yes. etc. Et yeah. So, you know, so it involved you in more harassment. Mm. Oh, can't, can't, can't you, please, why, why should I? Well, it's important. No, right. Like this, exactly. so... So, yes, I'd forgotten about that. I mean, phones were one of the, a big uh, bone of contention, weren't they? Yeah. And, uh, Use of phones, international phone calls, yes, right. even you know, domestic or you yeah. know, kind yes, of, uh, calls and, you know, long, long distance calls, etc. And so a lot of arguments, people would say, well, of course I do. I do. Shall I uh, stop using my phone at home for business reasons and so yeah. on? And uh, it, was, uh, it was that was quite a yeah. uh, thing that got blown up to all sorts of dramatic yeah. proportions yeah. at some stage. Um, I mean, the other thing I remember about uh, Manchester at that time, I mean, you, you, you and Peter were uh, heavily responsible for this, was the presence of a large number of Latin American yeah. postgraduates. And uh, I think it was a very exciting time when you got people from uh, you know, practically every yeah. Latin American country was represented at one yeah. stage or another, I think. Um, and uh, so it was, it was very exciting. Time. No, no, it's a very well, interesting project. It was great for me because yeah. it made possible a lot of my my research. I mean, Peru, my work in Peru, and Norman's yeah. work in Peru is basically to, uh, due to Carlos Savaniego, yeah. who came yeah. in Irish. and he yeah. was from Peru, mm. very eager, and mm. he sort of looked at us suspiciously because at that stage we were probably think, thinking more of Mexico and things mm. like that, but that, um, that Peru you should work in. Mm. And so so we got the money from the SSRC mm. and, and then uh, went to Peru. Mm. And Carlos was a presence there, and that was very mm. good. Teofilo Altibarano, who was the research assistant, who did come to Manchester, but only for you know a year, yes, then know. actually went, know, went yeah. with Norman to Durham. Mm. And, um, and he was our research assistant in Peru, and he's still a contact. Mm. And uh, he actually visits in, in Texas mm. too. And of course, one of our great success stories is um, of, with the Mexicans, uh, of course, Guillermo La Peña, yes, who's yes. now probably Mexico's mm. most distinguished anthropologist mm. in terms of publications mm. and, and uh, yeah. recognition. Mm. Um, but then Augustine and Meche, yes, oh, yes. you know, yes. that they came and, um, and you know, they, with them I have worked since mm. and uh, been working recently on projects, etc. And in fact, this... Yeah, just just recently, a month mm. ago, Augustine was appointed Director General mm. of CSS, which is the National Higher Centre for mm. Research and Teaching mm. in Social Anthropology. So mm. he's, uh, which is a, 
you know, an important decision. They have seven campuses throughout mm-hmm. Mexico, which allows them to, to yeah, work in yeah. different areas of the thing. Mm. So that was another Manchester product. Mm. You know, yeah. and we had good students. Yes, uh, no, that, Quite that, a few yeah. of the Brazilians. And Very some good, of them, yes. you know, yeah. Octavio Veil, yes, so. again, distinguished Brazilian anthropologist. Yeah, Salete. And Salete yes. does very good work yep. uh, up in Pernambuco mm. yep. and gain mm. in contact, mm. you know, so it's... Uh, no, I mean, you know, as you, as you know, you learn mm. an awful lot yeah. from your students. Yeah, <laughs> and yes. As you get older, they yeah. tend to do the yeah. actual work. And, you know, so and it, was, it was also a very sociable time. I yeah. remember that there was a lot of... Uh, um, hospitality, particularly your house in yeah. Broderick. Uh, but also Broderick. remember the carnivals we'd have. Oh, yes, you know, yes. Because, especially for Brazilians, in Manchester, come February, you're so fed up with not <laughs> having seen the sun for God knows how many months yeah. that everybody gets depressed, almost suicidal. And so then we had this idea, Susan probably, because <laughs> she's yes, good for this, said, like, let's have a carnival party in our house. And so we'd have this carnival party and everybody would come and, you would see, and stomp up and down and do samba and whatever else it is. And, yeah. You know, and everybody generally had a good yeah. time. Yeah. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. The only time I remember I had slight doubts about it was the, was the, uh, the last one we ever did, which was the February of 86, the year I was leaving. So we had our house on sale. And everybody was in there, and wooden floors, <laughs> and pumping up and down. I could see them going up and down. I thought, oh my God, perhaps it's going to break, and this will destroy our ability to sell the house. So I rushed down to the basement, looked up, could see it moving, but everything seemed all right. So I calmed down and went up. But it mm. was, no, it was a good time. Yes, they were very good times. Yeah. And, uh, no, that was, the, uh, of course, it's, yeah. it's partly a time of life too, but mm. one of the things I really remember well and very fondly of Manchester was the sociability, yeah. the social life. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw people outside of the mm-hmm. university a lot. We don't have that kind of life mm-hmm. in Texas. It's te- American yeah. academia is not as social mm-hmm. as uh, I suspect British academia. Mm-hmm. It's partly its size, you know, it's huge departments, everybody very mm-hmm. concerned with you know, their careers and getting things mm-hmm. done. So you don't socialize as much mm-hmm. as... Um, people typically used to do anyway yeah. in Britain. Yeah. And it's very, I mean, we, we all had sort of children who were roughly the same yeah. age and uh, they, they played with each other and we yeah. sort of, uh, you know, often uh, um, sort of shared um, all sorts of sociability yeah. and so, which was, uh, again, I think, very, uh, yeah. very agreeable time. Yeah. Um, there's one other, uh, um, uh, well, uh, aspect of that, which is uh, Barcelona. Um, mm-hmm. And there was quite an interesting uh, comparison between Manchester and, and Barcelona. Barcelona yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, which I can't quite remember why, why the hell this came about, but it seemed, seemed interesting. Well, I mean, it's, well, some of these things, uh, you know, have always been in, in, in interested in comparative urban mm-hmm. research yeah. and sort of, you know, and written, had written a little bit about the history of Manchester. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah. so I thought, well, let's have a look at Barcelona and how it evolved in different ways. But... To be frank, the, the real push was that we had this Catalan student, Ignasi, oh, yes, uh, Ferradis, yes. who, um, who really was a social anthropologist, mm. quite brilliant, and he came, we needed money to fund him. So I thought, well, okay, why don't do the comparative study, and then Ignasi will help with the Catalan side and help get researchers, and then we'll mm. organize the Manchester side. Um, that was fine, except, uh, of course, I put it in and, and in order to do so made it a very contemporary comparison mm-hmm. really around the, the mm-hmm. issue of social movements mm-hmm. which were beginning this is the last years of Franco were yep. beginning in uh, in in Spain and, mm-hmm. and Barcelona mm-hmm. etc and um, in Manchester you know, mm-hmm. not going to use social movements but at least yes. you can talk a little bit about yeah. how people organize themselves mm-hmm. in in different areas of the city you know, we're interested mm-hmm. in Oldham that kind of thing mm-hmm. places like that and so um, so we put it in the SRC, accepted it, Ray Paul thought it would be fine, mm-hmm. he was always supportive of that. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't as successful as it should have been. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's various reasons. I, uh, I was at a stage of my life when I still, find, still found it easier to work in someone else's country than my own. Mm-hmm. I know it's my Welshness or something that made me, you know, I always want to get out of Wales. And so it was, you know, so that, so the idea, well, so I concentrated more on the Barcelona end. And so the Manchester end wasn't perhaps as well supervised as it should have been. 
on on that side. But they did a reasonable job. Yeah. It wasn't the coherent. But the main disaster really was the Barcelona end, because right. Ignasi refused to do research on a contemporary topic. All right. He was going to study a textile mill of the 18th century. Mm-hmm. In the into the nineteenth century, and I said, "Well, what the hell has that got to do well, with some, preparing like <laughs> the contemporary situation like that?" that. Yes, yeah, we couldn't do that. <laughs> so, but he was adamant. But he said, "I'll find you people," and he found me a strange array of people who um, <laughs> who really you know, and they were Catalan. It's maybe mm-hmm. Catalan personalities that really didn't want to do what you asked them to do. <laughs> You'd say, well, I think like, if we're going to make a comparison with Muslims, we should do this. this. No, 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 we don't want to do that. We're not going to do that. We're going to do this, this, and this. Yeah. And it was, you know, perhaps I wasn't as authoritarian as I should be, but they went on. But I did have one excellent research assistant. Mm-hmm. That was Marisol Garcia. Oh, yes. Who, um, and of course, she's, she's not Catalan. <laughs> she is from Castillo. And, um, and she came with me and she was the best research assistant, mm-hmm. the most loyal of them mm-hmm. all. We went to La Macanista, the great yeah. um, uh, engineering plant in mm-hmm. Barcelona Harbor, oh, yeah. an old one, and, and found it was incredible. They gave us all the records. Of their right. of their workforce yeah. from you know really that that went back really to the 30s but mm-hmm. was particularly good in the post war the post second mm-hmm. world war our war uh, uh, period and and they had place of birth of the workforce etc cetera, etc cetera, and that kind of thing it was great because you could really see the huge immigration from Andalusia mm-hmm. into Barcelona Catalonia mm-hmm. in the 50s and 60s mm-hmm. you could capture it and as we were going through it all of a sudden both of us came across this Set of people, because they also had last place of employment, which is a nice mm. piece of information. And it said, Factory Number 6, Moscow. And we said, What the hell is going on? So we said, Man, it's all what's happening here. <laughs> this Franco Spain, how are they taking people from Factory Number 6 in Moscow? But uh, she did some, some you know, research on this and found out that, yes, indeed, there had been an exchange at that period mm. of time when in return for, I don't know what the Spanish um, gave the Russians, but the Russians really gave, well, gave them, yeah, it must have been that the Spanish gave the Russians something and then the Russians sent back, I don't know what the terms of exchange were, but sent back these people, presumably voluntarily, who decided they'd like to go home finally. Mm. And they were employed in Macanista, so they weren't mm. thrown in jail or anything like mm. that. So it was, but it's an interesting kind of mm. footnote to mm. to that kind of history. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, so that was fine. And I, mm. I, I yeah. like Barcelona, I still yeah. love Barcelona. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Still in touch with Marisol, mm. who is uh, yeah. now a, a full professor at mm. Uh, mm. the Central University and, mm. and quite active in mm. international uh, in mm. sociological association mm. and mm. citizenship issues mm. and, uh, and mm. other things. Mm. But uh, no, she's a wonderful person, <laughs> and uh, I always remember her. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And she did yeah. a, her doctorate actually in Hull. Oh, yeah, yeah. With okay. Valdo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, gosh. Oh, before, she, before Valdo came. Oh, look, yeah, Valdo, Valdo, moved, gone, Valdo moved to Hull, that's right. Yeah. Yes, I was yeah. losing, losing track of yeah. what was happening. Um, okay, I mean, I mean, we covered quite a lot of the um, you know, experience and life in, in Manchester and so on. Um, I just wondered, well, I mean, because obviously you've spent most of your uh, academic career um, in, in, in Texas and, 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 and where well, outside. 28 years Texas, now. Yeah. Um, so you've probably got some kind of uh, opportunity, I and mean, this is a very pompous question in a sense, to, but to look at sort of Manchester and its kind of uh, global perspective and, and so on. And, uh, well, you're at well, Manchester sociology uh, in particular, but also you know, any, any other kind of reflections on how Manchester looks from Texas, having spent most of your life there, most of your academic life there. No, I mean, for, for me, I, you know, I, I felt more comfortable in Manchester than, mm. I, than I did in the United mm. States. That was not a problem in the United mm. States because they recruited me at the top, so, yeah. it's, so mm. I didn't have to compete or do anything mm. like that. But, but I'm not adapted to American mm. academic mm. culture, mm. which is highly specialized, mm. highly career orientated, mm-hmm. and, and really, whereas in, in the old days that was a bit too much, it was the university that tended to dominate the career not mm. professional associations, etc. In the United States, it's the professional associations that mm. dominate mm. and through yeah. their sections. And yeah. people work in a section, they write articles for mm. their 
speciality or even mm. sub-speciality, mm. etc., which are sent to journals mm. will be evaluated by people from mm. the same speciality, sub yeah. Yeah. So there's a reproduction mm. of, of a, a type of knowledge which is, to my mm. mind, doesn't lead to innovation. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's good at reproducing. Mm. American sociology is excellent at reproducing itself. Mm. Mm. It's yeah. not yeah. so good, I think, in innovating very mm. much. Mm. That's and interesting. And I think, you know, in, in a certain sense, I think British sociology has mm. been innovative. But, of course, the mm. other side of the thing is the American sociological mm. enterprise is enormous. Mm. You know, because there's so many mm. places that teach sociology. So mm. the American sociological meetings are always about mm. 10,000 or something ridiculous mm. like that. You know, that, that are you know, swarming in there. You, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's, it's a very kind of impersonal mm. Play, mm. thing. And you typically, for that reason, you know, Departments are less important mm. for careers than than is you know participation in the professional associations, That's journal true. writing, yeah. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Having maybe mm. work groups with people from other universities mm. Mm. rather than your own university. Mm. That's interesting. So it's yeah. you know the pressure yeah. is more to mm. you know to mm. you know it's a central you know it's mm. a central what is this central fuel process mm. you know yeah. Yeah. Of, disp- sure. of, the, of dispersing people. Whereas, um, and of course, that's high speciality mm. means it's very difficult then to bring in insights mm. from other disciplines mm. because you know, people are not comfortable mm. with um, using history and mm. anthropology or ethnography, no, no. mixing it up with sociology, etc. Mm. I mean, and for area studies, and I was recruited, you know, basically mm. for Latin America and Latin American studies. Mm. But if you're doing that, then you do need mm. to mix these because yeah, otherwise. Yeah. You'll get a very uh, a, a very superficial view mm-hmm. of what's happening in the, mm-hmm. in these countries, mm-hmm. but you know. But I think the other thing is, I think we all sense is that sociology tends to be a national discipline. Mm-hmm. It's American sociology, British mm-hmm. sociology, mm-hmm. French sociology, mm-hmm. yep. German yep. sociology, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. And there's not that much citation mm-hmm. that's going between mm-hmm. them, which is yeah. you know a thing. You know, it's theory more. Theory. I was just, just thinking about. It. I mean, obviously, during your time, I suppose the two uh, two very important influences were um, Goffman and Garfinkel. Really. Yeah. Um, who were you know, particularly strong influences in Manchester during the time. Yeah, 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 I yeah, remember yeah. that. You remember, well, remember yeah, it was indeed. Yeah. yeah. No. 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 That's, and that's the symbolic interactionism generally. Yeah. Of yeah. No. No. That, that's the. Uh, no. It's and those kind of people. I doubt if. Because what tended to happen in the United States, you see, was that, um, that certainly uh, ethnomethodology, conversational analysis, um, mm. exists, but but hardly anymore. Mm. Yep. It's yep. not, you know, and yep. you know, yep. Garfield was somebody that people may know, mm. but actually I was surprised to find out that many of my colleagues didn't really know about mm, Garfinkel. Mm, mm. Certainly the students don't. That's interesting. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's not yeah. something that they would particularly use. Mm. Um, the more theoretically inclined of our students mm, mm. Um, certainly would, would use mm. French thinkers, be it Bordeaux or Foucault, mm. etc., etc. Yeah, yeah. Well, Foucault is also American, I suppose. But um, not so much, mm. not even, um, oh, remember who came over here too? That's the... Um, you know, presentation of self and everyday, uh, Go- Goffman. Goffman, yeah. 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 Um, you know, not even Goffman is, to my men- mm. my sense, you know, that use any more. Yeah. The more theoretical aspects are not. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, Goffman is actually one of those people whose influence gone well beyond sociology yeah. you know, as part of a general sort of cultural yeah. influence now. Mm. You know, so, but um, I don't know, that's, that's interesting. But but I think you, you know in our time yes I think mm. you, but it was more theoretically you know because mm. I mean after all its methodology is, is highly theoretical mm. you know that's the uh, and, you know based on phenomenology and mm. other kinds of things so that, mm. um, that 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 came over here mm. I mean admittedly the earlier stuff on um, social mobility stratification also mm. drew things from Lipset and mm. you know, yeah. Blau, etc. Yeah. But um, but in general, I mean, of course, there will be some cross-references, but mm. on the whole, if you look at articles mm. in the a- right. ASR, yeah. Yeah. there's, there's mm. thin references mm. to things. And mm. if you're talking about, you know, I mean, because your work on the family is known, mm. and uh, people would... Um, 
would, would cite mm-hmm. that. I mean, Christine Williams, our chair, mm-hmm. actually would, thought very highly of all that mm-hmm. stuff. And she, yes. was, nice she even thought more of me when I said, oh, I know him. <laughs> and, so <laughs> it's the, and so that was... Mm-hmm. Um, but, mm-hmm. but, but in general, you know, you, mm-hmm. you, you, people who were writing on the family in America mm-hmm. will write about the American family. Yeah. I think I think that's interesting. I mean, I remember a little project I, I actually put in the application for, but it was never sort of funded. I, I thought it'd be an interesting comparison to look at the way in which uh, family sociology mm-hmm. developed in Britain and the United States, and they followed quite different uh, trajectories. You know, and it's partly uh, uh, on one that kind of, in Britain there's still that ethnographic, uh, almost anthropological mm-hmm. influence, whereas it's very much the um, uh, more quantitative and looking very much at uh, you know, American family patterns and, and yeah, so on. Yeah. I mean, it's changed a bit now, but yeah. I think it, it was uh, yeah. it was very clear that the the, yeah. the two, although it's called sociology of the family in both yeah. cases, it was going in quite different directions. Okay, is there anything else that we've you know, I mean any other sort of particular memories of your uh, time in? Manchester that um, perhaps we haven't covered that you think that would be of interest to, uh, to people who might be watching this. Yes. Some um, I mean, there was the arrival of uh, Theodore Chanin. Yes. Of course, was, uh, <laughs> so quite, a, quite a, a great dynamic and disruptive film <laughs> <laughs> in, right. in life. And he, uh, lots of energy. But one thing, of course, Theodore never liked doing was administration. No. And that was the uh, that was that that was one of the one of the issues. I think I think one of the other reasons that I probably got um, got the chair when I did because I thought he he saw me as a possible administrator for right. the department, and so uh, and so so I got uh, loaded with a fair amount of that. Then he then he felt guilty, and then but not that he did it himself. He appointed no, no, no. somebody else to take I it over. So, yes. right. yeah. so it's the um, no, but. But but intellectually, of course, he was he mm. was he yeah. was very stimulating. Oh, yes. He brought yeah. a whole bunch of interesting yeah. people, right. in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so that that was that was also interesting, and you know, his and the whole emphasis on Russia, and then mm. you had all these mm. Russian students turned yes. up, didn't they? Oh yes, and were it? much more interested in Tolkien yeah. Parsons than they were in Marx. So that's, that's it's, right. <laughs> it's, right. it's, I suppose would be yeah. Yeah, far for the course, but yeah. it's the. Uh, Yes, we had these uh, Russian summer schools. Yeah. Well. That's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. was, um, yes, that was quite an experience. Because Theodore yes. went on to establish mm. this so- sociology, mm. economic and social social research institute yeah. in Moscow. Yeah, with the aid of uh, Soros. Soros. Uh, so, Soros' know, money, yeah. Money, money, yes, that's right. Yeah. Good, okay. Well, um, I mean, I've been mean, looking back at that time. Firstly, I, uh, personally, I, I think I owe great debt to you because you, you talked about the way in which you... Um, you know, took on some of the administration yeah. that uh, Theodore was uh, perhaps unwilling to yeah. pick up. And I, I, but I think you actually w- was, a, to me, it seemed to be a very sort of um, a, a solid sort of centre at the, at the heart of the... Uh, you know, you were always somebody who we could uh, go to and you had a quiet, uh, supportive word yeah. you know, when uh, all sorts of chaos was uh, developing yeah. around us. And I think, it, I think um, personally, I owe a great debt to your presence in the department at that time. Thank you very much, Brian. No, thank and, you, and, uh, and um, I hope uh, we've you know, covered most of the things that you'd like us to talk about. Yeah. Thank you. Mm.